and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And today we have the great pleasure of talking with Thelma Golden, the director and chief curator of the famed Studio Museum in Harlem. Before that, she was with the Whitney Museum. And among her written works, uh, black male representations of masculinity in contemporary art. And we're going to talk about that. It caused quite a stir, one of her first shows. And works on the black artist Lorna Simpson, Bob Thompson, and uh, Romay Bearden, uh, everybody, right? I mean, you are, we're so excited to have you here. We've only been trying for a year and a half, oh, well. Thelma. I'm glad that you're finally sitting in that chair. <laughs> thank you. It's really good to be here. Thank you for the invitation and thank you. Oh, no, thank me. you so much for the, for the uh, expertise that you've put into mm -hmm. uh, defining and uh, exploring black art in, in, uh, in America and globally, mm -hmm. because I know that that was part of the, you know, the opening of the Studio Museum, mm -hmm. not just black American artists, but globally exactly. Afri uh, Af artists of African descent. Exactly. So, exactly. but we start by asking our guests to talk about themselves, to mm -hmm. place themselves in black America. And I think we share some history here. So you, you grew up in Queens. I was born and raised in Queens, uh, grew up in St. Albans, Queens, and, you know, lived there through my entire childhood. Um, went to school on Long Island in Manhattan, and very early in my childhood, the real gift of growing up in New York is that I got to grow up in a city so rich in museums and began going to museums as a small child, and that's what began my love of art. And who would take you to the museum as a small child? Well, I first went to museums um, through my school, through uh -huh. field trips, through the, right. you know, And incredible. you were at the Tony, is the... Buckley School? Buckley Country Day School. Right, right, right Roslyn, right. Um, which right. is on the north shore of Long Island, but close to Manhattan. Right. And there I had incredible teachers who believed in the way in which the arts sort of open up the world to us. And so we had the occasion to see dance, to see theater, and of course also to visit museums. Um, but when I began to love museums, my parents began taking me um, right in Queens to the Queens Museum, right. um, which you know I've been visiting for most of my life. Life, but also to museums like the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Metropolitan Museum, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art. I mean, you know, this city is rich in incredible museums and the opportunity with just a very short trip, right, from my home to be in these incredible institutions really changed my life. But, but even, I read that even at 12 you knew that you wanted to be a curator. Did you know what had you discovered the word, the actual word curator, and that's what you wanted to do? You know, I had, because mm -hmm. by then I was completely embedded in an idea of studying art history. You know, I was really lucky. I had an incredible educational base. So tell, tell us about that, though. How did you get to the private Buckley School, Country Day School? Yeah. Uh, your folks made the decision that they were going to... Early, early on. Both of my parents are, were born and bred New Yorkers. My mother was born and raised in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, my father in Harlem. They were both children of immigrants who understood that for themselves education was critical. So that, you know, my father and mother both went to New York City Public Schools. Mm -hmm. My father went on to City College and then Howard University. And what did he do? Uh, oh. My father was an insurance broker and oh. a lawyer oh. and ran a business, uh, Property Casualty Insurance, oh. Golden and Golden Insurance, which he ran out of an office for first in Harlem, mm -hmm. and then by the early 70s in Queens. Mm -hmm. And when my parents married in 1963, my mother being from Brooklyn, my father being from Harlem, that was a conversation that really led them to thinking about where they would start their family, and that's when they moved to Southeast Queens. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when it was time for my brother, who's a year younger than I, to go to school, my parents really thought hard about mm -hmm. what an educational opportunity meant and what they could provide and made the choice at that time, which is one that came you know, with great sacrifice on their sure, part, sure. Um, to send us to private school. And we went to Buckley, which was, which was and is an amazing school. I know. I was, I was on the website and doing the research, and they list you as one of their yeah. stellar. You may be the right. outstanding. Standing Gretch. No. 
<laughs> Buckley has graduated many outstanding people, but I'm very proud to have gone there. I'm yeah. very proud for what it represented, right, in my life. It gave you a, a strong foundation and the arts. And the arts. So they gave yeah. they gave the world Thelma Golden. Yeah, and it was sense. a particular teacher, Lucille Buck. Really? I mean, she's really the one who taught me art history mm -hmm. and really opened up the door to not simply the idea of making art, right, which was important to me as a young mm -hmm. child, but this idea of works of art, right? and this incredible legacy of humanity that lives in works of art. So that through Buckley and through Mrs. Buck uh, and going to museums, by the time I got to high school, which is really when I decided to be a curator, again, through amazing teachers, and in particular in my high school, the New Lincoln School, which was on oh, the yes. Upper East Side of Manhattan, yes. um, with a pioneering, amazing educator who ran that school, Vern Oliver, uh -huh. she really forced me to think not just generally about what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be, but to really name it. And that's when I was able to understand what a curator was and decided that's what I wanted right, to be. Right. Something must have been going on in New Lincoln. That's where Elizabeth Sackler went yes, as well. Exactly. So. We share that. Adrian Piper, right. the amazing uh. pioneering artist, also went to New Lincoln along with many, 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 again, other amazing people. Right. Again, another fantastic educational institution that created such good values around not just learning, but engaging. Right. right. And for those who don't know Elizabeth Sackler, of the Sackler family, of the recently chair of the Brooklyn Museum yeah. and has her own feminist and center. And the Sackler yeah, Center for Feminist Art, really right. a pioneering uh, institution right. within the Brooklyn Museum, right. but really sort of opening up and opening out, you know, the sort of history of women in the arts and really writing an important and powerful feminist history. Right. So now then you, I mean, I could talk about, uh, this is a wonderful, you know, the, the sort of the formation of, uh, of, yeah. of an artist yeah. going on through this. Yeah. At Smith, uh, yeah. you majored in in art, art history. history and African American studies. Right. I was a double major and very consciously so. You know, majoring in art history, of course, was important. It gave me, you know, the incredible academic foundation that my work continues to, to exist, you know, out of. But also, double majoring in African American mm -hmm. studies really began the seeds for the kind of work that I'm doing today. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the work. Yeah. You uh, made a splash into all of the newspapers and television and all and uh, because of one of your early uh, shows uh, at the Whitney mm -hmm. uh, called The Black Male. Yeah. Um, so let's take a clip. You did a TED Talk. You're going to talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. and then we'll come mm -hmm. out and talk about the major mm -hmm. controversy in the art world. Okay. There we go. <laughs> in 1994, when I was a curator at the Whitney Museum, I made an exhibition called Black Male. It looked at the intersection of race and gender in contemporary American art. It sought to express the ways in which art could provide a space for a dialogue, complicated dialogue, dialogue with many, many points of entry, and how the museum could be the space for this contest of ideas. This exhibition included over 20 artists of various ages and races, but all looking at black masculinity from a very particular point of view. So uh, wh why was it controversial? Now that we look back and say, you think that was controversial. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, at the time I made the exhibition and I hoped that it would be important. I hope that it would be significant. I hope that it would open up a conversation, not simply about what the exhibition itself was about, which was looking at race and gender through the image of the black male in contemporary art from the late 60s to that present, 1994, but even open up the space of what it means to make exhibitions about race, about identity, about culture and history, and what that means in museums. Could be, museums be an important place where we could have those conversations? Um, the controversy um, really sort of opened up around the interpretation of not just the exhibition, but what the exhibition represented in mm -hmm. terms of an opening of an art world and a museum world to these kinds of ideas. And that uh, sent you shortly thereafter to the Studio uh, Museum, uh, following in uh, the great Lowry Sims' footsteps, uh, mm -hmm. as and uh, uh, Mary Schmidt Campbell as well, as well uh, wow. to produce. So, so that this TED Talk, I was. Uh, you should watch the whole thing when you get a chance because you talk about the cultural impact that art can have. And now, 
We are in a politically sensitive, culturally sensitive time now. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what what can art do to help us through through these times? What do you see the artists doing? Well, you know, I, in this moment, I've been thinking a lot about the founding moment of the Studio Museum. You know, when the Studio mu Museum was founded in the late '60s, also a complicated fifty-year anniversary, right? almost. Yeah, yeah, we're getting we're getting there, getting right. ready to celebrate that, which is going to be fantastic. But you know, in that moment, was also a complicated moment in mm -hmm. our culture, and artists were making work that reflected that complexity, that critiqued the culture that looked at ways of providing an alternative view of how they understood the world and I think that's what will happen now. This is the gift that artists mm -hmm. give us, right? That their vision allows us to understand the world in broader and deeper ways. And I feel like in this moment we will see artists speaking broadly um, about the world we're in but also reflecting back on our history. Well, I, I know that you you say this is not what you do. You're a curator. You're developing new brand. You're developing the next Basquiat's. That's what well, I you know as a curator, you know one is interested in creating narratives around art, right? Exhibition making is really narrative making. You're either looking at the narrative of an artist's career by creating for an audience the ability to see their development over time, or you're thinking about themes and ideas and looking at the ways in which works of art help us to understand those themes and ideas, or you're really allowing artworks to create for people a space of wonder, a space of awe, a space of inspiration that can come when we stand in the presence right, of great works of art. And, and often that happens at the Studio Museum. I, I was interested though, it had never occurred to me that the studio part of the yeah. Studio Museum yeah. was this specific yeah. developing that you do of artists mm -hmm. and of some of the artists who have been artists in residence there. Yeah, well the studio in our name comes mm -hmm. from the fact that at the founding of the museum, the founders really thought it was important not only to present and preserve the work of artists of African descent, but to really also provide a sense of possibility, opportunity, and to nurture emerging mm -hmm. artists. So that our studio program, which every year invites three artists to spend a year in the museum, their studios are right on the third floor of the museum, and in that year to work and to deepen their own practice, but also to exist within the context of the museum's life as a whole, and to also be inspired by Harlem. And over the course of this program, which is as old as the museum, we've mm -hmm. been thrilled and proud to have artists such as Alison Saar and David Hammonds and Carrie oh. James Marshall and Kehinde Wiley and Micheline Thomas and Julie Moretu and you know so many others who've been a part of that program and remain a part of the family of the Studio Museum. Right, and are now hugely successful, hugely, as someone would say, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the art world. Yeah. Um, you've got something uh, uh, going on uh, in the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting that I, I hadn't realized also that the Studio Museum was originally a bank. I mean, I think I knew it maybe as the department store. Exactly. But exactly. I, didn't, I didn't know it as, that. Right, yeah. as a mm -hmm. bank beforehand. Mm -hmm. And so some of that is landmarked, right? Yeah. What is it? The, no, no, actually the building isn't landmarked. It was built in 1914 as the Kenwood Office Building. Mm -hmm. And it, in its lower floor, occupied uh, was a bank. Right. And the upper floors were offices lawyers and uh, you know other kinds of businesses and then in the 60s it sort of had a couple different lives one was a furniture store um, and then was vacant and the studio museum was very lucky to acquire the building in 1979 this was at the point when the studio museum was being brilliantly led by dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell yes. who went on after her time at the studio museum to be commissioner of cultural affairs for the city of New York then the dean of the Tisch School for the Arts and now the at president Spelman. of Spelman president College of Spelman, right? um, and dr. Campbell uh, mm -hmm. was director at the time that this building was acquired in 79 and in 81 she opened the museum in this building, mm -hmm. sort of fully actualizing what the founders in 68 imagined, right? A space right. where audiences from Harlem and all over the city and the world could come and really experience black art in right. all of its forms. And and designed by Max Bonn. We're, Ma we're Max Bonn fanatics around here, well, you know. He, you know. We, we did a piece, uh, an hour-long yeah. piece about the oh, wow. African-American Museum. Mm -hmm. 
And mm -hmm. uh, so that's where we first discovered him. We said, he's fantastic, he's yeah. did so much. And now one of his disciples, David Age, yeah. is doing the new incarnation of the Studio Museum. Yeah, yeah. You know, Max Bond was a you know, pioneering yeah. architect, a real you know, sort of legend in his field mm -hmm. in not only the brilliance of his design work, but the sort of commitment and the values that he had about architecture and its role to transform communities. Mm -hmm. And so Max was a Studio Museum friend, supporter, board member, and took on the renovation of that building, um, which at the time the museum acquired it, required a lot of work sure. to take what it had been and open it up and create a space that would be a, not just appropriate for art, but really a space that would be amazing and engaging for audiences. And Max did that. And mm -hmm. it really is, for me, always the great gift of that space to kind of understand the dimensions mm -hmm. of possibility, right, that are so tied to the legacy that Max Bond has left right. around adaptive reuse, that we have lived and worked and really thrived in that building for yeah, so many years. Love it. And now you have David Age, recently knighted, yes. you know, magnificent building that mm -hmm. he uh, created, mm -hmm. uh, the African American Museum. And also Sugar Hill, yes. up in my neighborhood, exactly. the Sugar Hill Museum. Exactly. It's done and some the Sugar Hill housing right. development, a real, again, pioneering building when we right. look at, you know, what it means for architects to take on this idea of, you know, how can we transform culture through the built right. space? And what David made in that building, which includes the Sugar Hill Museum, mm -hmm. proud to be their neighbor, but also those spaces now that families are living in. Exactly. That it's, is just incredible. Now, now, is it true that I know that in one incarnation, the Studio Museum was going to have something of a reverse uh, front porch or a front stoop? Or no, is, we're still in design. Uh -huh. So really what's gone on with the building now is that we have spent, since the time we announced this about two years ago, uh, Ajay Associates, uh, David Ajay's architecture firm, along with Cooper's Robertson and a team of museum staff, board, et cetera, have been working hard mm -hmm. on a design that we are almost finished with. And there were many ideas that are in this design that we'll probably carry through to our final design. And one of them was David's response to what was my initial idea that I gave to the architects of how I thought it might be important to think about certain experiences of Harlem when thinking about this building. And for me, those experiences were the experience of the street, right. the experience of the stage, and the experience of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And when in the initial sort of uh, real working process around the building and then his initial presentation, David Ajay added to those three, the street, the stage, the sanctuary, he added the stoop. The stoop, right. As right. an essential right. idea of understanding Harlem and very particularly this idea of this space which takes you from the sort of public space of the street into the private space of the, of the home. So in this, in this new incarnation, yeah. you're going to be able to show more of your permanent collection. It's how many pieces do you have? Is it, it's thousands. It's over 2,000 works that right. range from the 19th century to the present, right. all media artists that are both based in the U.S., but from all over the world. So it's an amazing collection, which really tells the story, an incredible story about the work of black artists. We currently have an exhibition on view called Regarding the Figure, right. which looks at the implications of figuration in work by black artists from our collection. But the new building will allow us to have a lot of flexibility in the ability to present our collection, to present our changing exhibitions to do the work that we've done for many years, presenting emerging artists in their first exhibitions, doing surveys of mid-career artists, and of course, celebrating those artistic masters such as Barclay Hendricks, who sadly we recently lost, oh, yes. who passed away. This is his work, Lottie Mama, a real icon of our collection. Right. But you know, to have exhibitions as we were thrilled to have the retrospective of Barclay Hendricks' work some mm -hmm. years ago at the Studio Museum, the new space will allow us to do all of that while also serving our audiences, serving our family audiences, our Harlem neighbors, tourists who come to visit us from all over the world, New Yorkers who see the Studio Museum as a place that they want to visit over and over again. Right, right, right. And, you know, I drag my grandchildren through there. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, we're, you know, it's, we're? it makes me very thrilled, you know, when people say to me that it's a place that they want to experience with friends and family, right? That the experience of the Studio Museum is one that they think of, you know, doing over and over again 
again, when they visit New York or New Yorkers who come back all the time, because that's how we think of the museum, right? As a right. space accessible. Exactly, exactly. Now, in, in the TED Talk, mm -hmm. um, you, you speak of Harlem as a place that no one thinks of just in the present. It's the mm -hmm. past and, and the future. What about the future of Harlem when it looks like because of gentrification, Harlem will no lo may no longer be a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, what what happens then? Well, I often say that you know one of the funny experiences of Harlem that yet deeply, profoundly affects the way I think about it is the way in which it is so possible often to hear people talk about what Harlem was mm -hmm. and what Harlem will be, mm -hmm. right? And not for them to fix you know in the moment. And the reason for that, I've come to think, is because this is a community that has always been in transformation, right? There's a dynamism to Harlem as it is lived through its various lives. And when we think about the future, I mean, the future I think about is one in which Harlem remains sort of understood through its culture, because that's the work that we do at the Studio Museum, mm -hmm. right? We create the opportunity for understanding the culture of Harlem, which is defined by the culture of African Americans and people of African descent, mm -hmm. and being able through art and artists to continually mine the incredible history um, of the neighborhood, the incredible history of the legacy of the neighborhood, and we'll be able to do that in the future. It's why thinking about the yeah. 50th anniversary is so important, because right. I feel we've lived as an institution through some of through, this history. Through all of that. We're yeah. very glad you're documenting it, because yeah. it, it may be only in the museum that yeah. we will be able to, yeah. to see it. It's a terrible thing to say. It reminds yeah. me somewhat of the Museum of Natural History. Yeah. for the, mm -hmm. But, you know, at least you are making sure that, yeah. you know, our children and grandchildren will be able to experience, yeah. experience it. And it's not just the Studio Museum. You know, I have to say, I live in Harlem among some great mm -hmm cultural institution peers, the Apollo Theater, the National Black Theater, Dance Theater of Harlem, the Schomburg, the sure. Harlem School for the Arts, Harlem Stage, and you know, so many others. You know, we've welcomed the sort of Caribbean Cultural Center to Harlem as well, as they're now on 125th Street. And when I think about Harlem of the future, I think about the Studio Museum and all of my cultural institution peers being the anchor you know, for what it means to understand culture in the neighborhood, the culture of the neighborhood mm -hmm. and the culture of our people. I, w I want to talk a little bit about your, uh, I mean, you, you would be described as one of the influencers of the world. You know, we see mm -hmm. you in the, for the fashion pages mm -hmm. and you're married to a fashion designer and you're wearing. I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. I am. So, but, but I read in one of the pieces about you that you two would never show up in the same article or the, until that time. Mm -hmm. Why, why was that? You, I love that you had first been trying to get one of his dresses and were, you were on a wait list. I was tell, on a wait list tell for, that for story. many years. I, you know, I am um, married to Dura Olowu, who is an amazing fashion designer of Nigerian descent, London-based. Right. And um, I first read about uh, his line, his fashions, in Vogue. Um, in 2004 or 2005 mm -hmm. and immediately ran, wanted desperately to get one of his dresses and, um, and was put on a waiting list that I never got <laughs> off of. And uh, when we had the occasion to meet, that was sort of one of the first things that I said to him was what a fan I was yeah, of I... his work and what a fan I was of his fashion and how much it really um, spoke to me in the same way that many of the artists I've been privileged to work with also spoke to me, you know, that his work was very much inspired by history and culture and identity. Mm -hmm. What he brought into his work was the sort of personal sensibility of having grown up in Nigeria, grown up in an environment where costume and textile live as culture, and but also the way in which he was a deep scholar of the mm -hmm. history of fashion, a, a curator of it yes. in many ways, sort of understood, you know, the sort of... You guys are century. a perfect, a perfect pair. Yeah, you, know. you know, it's so yeah. seldom that you find that. But I did, I did read also there that you made him get a storage room or for his collection. Well, of... well, he collects and <laughs> right. he collects widely, and right. you know, Fa as, textiles, uh, textiles, and, and right. fabrics. And you know, we talk about this preservation of culture. I mean, yes. what I've learned from him is, you know, just as we might speak here about, you know, the way in which we want to hold on to our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, and museums are about that. You know, he is so committed, you know, to the history of textile as it 
it is used um, in West Africa and often seeks out these textiles, which are no longer perhaps as easy to find, to preserve them because well, you, it feels, you know, that that's important. Yeah, um, you have to invite me to a dinner party. Yeah. I just want to hear you two talking, you know, about yeah. art. Yeah, uh, it would wow. be such a thrill. When we uh, finish our programs as we're coming to a close, yeah. which is this time has just flown by, we always ask our guests oh. to place themselves in uh, uh, not only place themselves mm -hmm. in black America, but to finish the statement, mm -hmm. the power and the strength of black America lies in. How would you finish that? The power and strength of black America lies in our culture. And for you, that means preserving it, developing it? That means preserving it, presenting it, interpreting it for me personally, but also it means for all of us to engage with it so that we find and keep the inspiration that comes from this incredible manifestation of ourselves and our lives and our history. And where do you see yourself mm -hmm. when you're celebrating 50 years of the Studio Museum? Now, you haven't been there for 50 years, yeah. but 10 years, yeah. a decade at yeah. any rate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Where, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? What's the, what's the future of, of uh, the art life of yeah. Thelma Golden? Well, look, Right now, I think most immediately what I think about most is the opportunity to imagine that this building is going to grow in Harlem. And I look forward to opening the doors of the new studio museum and welcoming in audiences to experience the power and the beauty of the work by artists of African descent. Well, thank you so much. We'll be there. And please, we're so please. thrrilled that you're in well, charge. I hope people will come you know, on site when we, when we open. We definitely will be there. Thank you right. so much, Thelma thank Golden. Thank you. Thank the studio you. Museum in Harlem and thanks for you all out there for watching us as well. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America and we'll see you the next time.